Welcome to Inventing Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Brittany Zimmerman. And I'm your co-host, Richard Ha. And today we are going to do a deep dive into our M invention, which is modern day Ahukua'a. How you doing, Richard? Pretty good, pretty good. Awesome. I know this is a topic near and dear to your heart. So why don't you kick us off by telling us what is a modern day Ahukua'a? Well, you know, in a simple way, it's the the way people were doing it before, the you know, Ahupua system, but we're adding modern technology to it. So essentially, um, it had to do with uh, water, and water runs downhill. So depending on how, where the water is, everybody depends on the water shares it with, with each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, you grow the different plants that's applicable or the different uh, crops or fishing depends on where you are in 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 the elevation, mm-hmm. and uh, modern day Ahupua is the same thing except that we're going to be using as much uh, modern technology as as we know how. Awesome! And for those people who aren't as familiar with an Ahupua, is this something that one person would run, one family? Is this a whole community? Uh, tell us a little bit about what it originally looked like, and then let's dive into what a modern-day Ahupua looks like. Okay, well, you know, it used to be a, a communal kind of a thing where there's a lot of people uh, doing different things and supporting it, each other. This lends itself to what we call reciprocity. And the reason for it, it was back in the old days, they did not have medals. And because they did not have medals, they did not have money. So they couldn't make change. So so because you couldn't make change, you had to trade. Still, you had to trade. Mm-hmm. When you traded, uh, and that's where the origination of the more you give, the more you receive came from. And essentially, that's the basis of aloha. Yeah, reciprocity, for sure. And it, it's a very different way than the way we live today, right? Which is um, very transactional. Um, I know that you know, when you've spoken before about this big transition between reciprocity and transactionalism with the introduction um, of metals, right, we have to think about what it looks like in our everyday lives, right? What does it look like with the uh, credit systems and the monetary and the banking systems that we live under today? And do you feel, Richard, individually like there is a way to still live in a way that is based off of reciprocity in a day and age where transactionalism is really the environment, right, that is is here and prevalent. Yeah. Well, you know, I was actually, now I think about it, I was really lucky because when I was growing up, my pop Mm -hmm. would pound the table and yell, not no can, can. So (laughs) he instilled in us his positive... um, a way of thinking. He would mm-hmm. say, uh, get a thousand reasons why no can. I'm only looking for the one reason why I can. Yeah. <laughs> and then he would say something that, you know, it says, look for three answers for every problem and one more just in case. You know, when you, you're 10 years old, it doesn't really um, click. But when you get to be my age at 79, and you say, oh, okay, I see what's <laughs> going on here. But essentially, what was going on, you know, and then that was really significant. Was, mm-hmm. uh, if you have to look for three answers for every problem, and you've already got in your mind where you want to go in the future, mm-hmm. all the alternatives has to be based on facts. So basically, each of the alternatives has to be based on science. Otherwise, mm-hmm. your answer will be wrong. And I didn't mm-hmm. know that for a long time. But then, you know, as, as I got older and older, Oh, okay. That makes sense. Right. Yeah, for sure. And so, you know, I think a lot of the lessons uh, that were passed down to you are certainly applicable, not only in the days of the Ahupua'a, but also today, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, did you want to tell us anything more about what a traditional modern uh, or a traditional Ahupua'a look like before we transition into what a modern one looks like? Well, I'd like to say this. Because... It happened to me when I was 10 years old. Mm-hmm. I know what, you know, this idea that you give for kids, 
if you mm-hmm. give them the tools, that's how young they that, that we can affect their uh, yeah. living. So yeah. I want to say that, and and then we can jump into this. What's the modern okay. stuff? That sounds wonderful. So uh, I know that you had a property which was being utilized for the biggest banana farm in the state. You were utilizing it for tomatoes um, and that you have decided on a bit of a transition for this property. And walk us through, Richard, kind of the transition between the farming and the agriculture that you were doing, and then utilizing this property first for the modern day office block. Well, you know, I started off um, on on this journey back when I got out of the army, and you know, so all, all the values my pop gave me. But when I, when I came out of the army, I went to um, Maku, our family land there at Maku, and uh, Uncle Sonny. The, the son of uh, Tutu Lady, who's the most influential person on, on my life at, at, when I was young. Uncle Sonny had gone uh, and became a merchant marine, which means he went from subsistence farming and he went all over the world. Then he mm-hmm. came back. And then he came right back to subsistence farming. And, mm-hmm. and what is interesting about him is that on his desk, there's a kerosene lantern because that's no more, no more electricity, right? Yeah. Kerosene lantern and a stack of U.S. News and World Reports. Isn't that something? <laughs> yeah. And, and a juxtaposition. Only, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh. So a stack of U.S. News and World Reports. And then he would um, talk about, oh, well, I, I just noticed that uh, he was influenced by the uh, extension agent a lot. Mm. The extension agent would come and visit and talk to him about what he was growing. At that time, mm-hmm. he was growing uh, watermelons. He'd been mm-hmm. in tomatoes and other things, but at that particular time, it was watermelons. And so he showed me that, uh, you know, herbicide to control the grass. How would you do that? And he didn't talk to me. He just, by example, I just watched it. And he would go do the mixture and then take a piece of California grass, the grass he was going to spray and stick it in the water and look at it to see if it was reacting the way it's supposed to. In other words, you know, if regular grass, it would bead right off, no problem. But mm-hmm. when you do it and you check it and it's smooth and, you know, that means it's uh, covering the whole leaf. So, mm-hmm. I, that, you know, I just, I'm over there keeping my mouth shut because he's a real strong personality kind of guy, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And then when he started growing uh, uh, um, watermelons, he showed me that, uh, again, not showed me, he just demonstrated that uh, in the middle of the day, the um, fruit fly would be attracted to these corn plants he planted outside the field. Mm -hmm. And then he pulled out his can of reed and he went over there and he he shot the, the, the fruit flies with the can of reed instead of having to spray the whole thing. Oh. Yeah, because that's where they hear that they're not mid- middle yeah. of the day. So I, I, I'm looking at that. Holy smokes, that's pretty interesting. But what I got out of that was two major things. The pluses have to exceed the minuses to be sustainable. So that's right. one. And number two is, if the farmer makes money, the farmer will farm. Mm-hmm. So those two ideas is all I need to have to you know, be thinking about whether it'll work or not. Understood. And so uh, when you were doing your agriculture, when you were working with the bananas and the tomatoes and everything that you did after, was the idea of the modern day Ahukua already in your mind or is that something that culminated later? It was just sitting there because the values I had was in that direction. Those two mm-hmm. values that I said. So, so then as uh, when I... It was back in 2007 when I went to the PCOL conference for the first time. Mm-hmm. You know, that that was an eye-opener to me because they told us the world had been using twice as much oil as it had been finding and had been doing that for the last 20 years. It doesn't take a genius to figure out, okay, wait a minute, how much is there left? Is it, is it going to last forever? And the answer is no. But then when I came back, I couldn't very well say, well, you know what? 
everybody, the sky is falling. <laughs> that ain't going to work. So, mm -hmm. so I just, you know, kind of, I went to, you know, four or five more conferences. I learned a lot. And I, because it was so ins uh, important, I spent a lot of time in the background. And so mm -hmm. all of the stuff was, is there. But now it's coming to a head now because we don't have really that much time left. And we have right. much more time than we think. That's mm -hmm. how I feel about it. All right. So um, now you have your property and you're looking at making it a modern day ahupua'a. Can you now walk us through what a modern day ahupua'a looks like? You said that um, we would be looking at maybe all of the same basic principles um, as traditional ahupua'as, but utilizing a new or modern technologies for that. Could you give us a couple of examples so that we can start conceptualizing what that might look like? Okay, so given the, uh, the environment we operate in, we're in Hawaii, the land is not flat, and it's up and down and whatever, so we have to take that into consideration, which means we can't have the volume that other places in the world can, can have because they can have giant uh, uh, equipment. We can't. So we have to have a different solution to this problem. So what I'm thinking we could do is try to find multiple income streams and then also, we got to make the land affordable because farmers just coming in, and we're talking about new farmers because the old farmers are quitting and it's all, you know, they're retiring and there's nobody to take over. So we got to get the younger people to get in, but can they afford it? So it's got to be manageable, smaller size, maybe 10 acres or so. And, and then we help them with multiple income streams. So that's um, the, the basic thing. Oh, so. Um, so you're saying, okay, we have the large ahupua'a, we could break it down into 10 acres or so, um, where people could take on responsibility of a part of the ahupua'a, a specific cultivar, a specific process, maybe it's ulu, maybe it's, um, maybe it's kalo, maybe it's fish, um, but help them to take a modern approach to it. When yeah. you think of these modern approaches, um, what kind of things are you thinking of? So, so we start off with uh, multiple income streams, yeah, to mm -hmm. give and and it's to give the farmer resilience. If something goes down, then there's others to back him up because he's got mm -hmm. a family, or whatever, yeah. So, um, so if you're looking at uh, multiple income streams, one one thing that you might consider is uh, high value timber, not mm -hmm. a lot. But you know, the, the places that you can't really use, stick mm -hmm. them over there because 25 years is how long it'll be before you can utilize. And at mm -hmm. that, you might be, you, you can choose. Should I use it for myself for my retirement? Should I use it for the kids or whatever? But it's a multiple, I mean, that's income stream that's separate from what, what we're looking at today, just, you know, mm -hmm. cash and, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's mm -hmm. one, one way. Uh, another way of looking at it is, um, given the land, what, what it is, if, it, if it's uh, real slopey and rain runs down real strong, then you might choose the kind of crops that, that, that you know, like, you know, ulu or um, these kinds of crops where you have uh, uh, grass growing on the, on the bottom to keep the soil there. So that's, that's a possibility. And multiple, multiple kinds of uh, crops that can grow under those conditions. And okay. yeah. Yeah. What, one other one was really interesting is sweet potato. If you grow sweet potato, um, the, the traditional way, there's so much left in the ground. And then you have to wait 18 months or so before you can come back in because of there's disease in the ground, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, if you use hydroponics and had a, 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 a gutter kind of a system where it like a rain gutter, and mm -hmm. you had one end where the fertilizer and the, and the liquid is in. And then every so often, there's a place in it where there's something that can, uh, you put a bag of, of, of uh, 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 media. And when you put it, it sucks the, the, the water into the bag. Mm. That way it sucks the water and nutrient into the bag. But the thing about it is, it doesn't take uh, much to... Uh, monitor something like that. You could send the mm -hmm. kids go check the water. And then you can harvest 
and use 100% of the, the product. Mm. And you can come in as fast as you can replace it and get it going again. You can replant. You don't have to wait. Mm -hmm. So that's another right. way of doing it. Then yeah. all the other things, you know, depending on who's doing that, they can decide what they want to do. Yeah. But mm -hmm. just, just ideas, you know, of what could be done. Yeah, for sure. And as you talk about some of that, right, um, in terms of maybe hydroponic options and things along those lines, those typically require um, significant amounts of water and energy. Um, is there anything special about your particular property that helps with one or both of those? Well, you know, we have two springs on the property that you can actually see those are springs. And what is really interesting about that is it, it's, it's spring water that comes out from deep into the lava from, from high elevation. And what that means is that the pH of the water is stable 7.23, something like that. Mm -hmm. The chemical content is stable because it's coming through the rocks. Mm -hmm. And the temperature is stable. So now you can do a lot of adjusting to that given what you already know. So you're not just throwing stuff and wasting it, yeah? Mm -hmm. So just play with it, to what makes sense, yeah? Okay, yeah. So for the crops that need a lot of water, right, you're on Hamakua, a coast area, you have a lot of rainfall, and you also have uh, two springs on the property to be able to feed large amounts of water um, to some of those crops. So you have uh, different types of energy sources that may be available to the island, but on your particular property and for the modern day Ahupua'a, you have hydropower. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. The, the hydropower came from... Uh the flume system that the plantation made. Now, that, that's a really interesting situation because the flume system takes the water down from Waiahama Stream and it comes down and it goes into Aliyah Stream. Mm -hmm. Now, Aliyah Stream is interesting because Aliyah Stream is not a stream that's down in the, in the valley. It's, it's a stream that runs on, a, on, on the ridgeline. How is that, you would think? Mm -hmm. So, so you know, and, and it runs down the ridge line and it goes to the bottom. And in the old days, they used to plant taro over there. Mm -hmm. So how, how would that happen? Uh, my best guess is that it probably was caused by an earthquake a long, long time ago. The spring bought, uh, jumped out of the, uh, uh, I mean, the water came out of the ground and it was on flat ground. And there were all these other places that had uh, the rivers and gullies and this and that. And so it was on mm -hmm. the top. And that's, but anyway, that's a live stream. I got sidetracked here. Um, <laughs> but it's so interesting, you know? So, so essentially what I'm saying is you, you got to be kind of fleet-footed and, and look at your situation and try to be as open-minded as you can and use the, mo the most modern technology that you have um, based on science. Mm. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. And that's how you utilize your um, spring water. You produce energy from the movement of water. And then you can utilize that to support some of the other, maybe uh, hydroponic or higher tech solutions. Um, maybe uh, there are even some uh, value added uh, things that can be done to help make food uh, more uh, sustainable here, right, on Hawaii Island in particular. Um, I know that we had spoken before and you were talking about the vision, right, of having these different sections of the property uh, that different groups were taking care of and collectively they make uh, this modern day ahukua'a. Can you talk us through um, what an individual or a group would do if they wanted to collaborate with you? Um, on this. Is there a way that people could reach out or are you looking for additional partners for uh, building this Ahupua'a up? Uh, we're working um, closely with the Go Farm program at the University of Hawaii. We're working with the Go Farm program. We're also mm -hmm. working with the uh, uh, the department, uh, the CTAR, College of Tropical Agriculture. Mm -hmm. Because we, we sat in on interviews of the various different people that were coming in to, to become the new president now that mm -hmm. the yeah. person has been up, appointed. And mm -hmm. I'm real optimistic about that person. So we're working very closely with him. So so we'll, and, and mm -hmm. with all these things that we talked about, that's what we're pushing, yeah, trying to 
Yeah. Yeah. And are you open to working with other groups or individuals? Like if somebody's watching this and thinks, you know, I would really love to start doing um, some value added processing uh, with the modern day office. What are, or I would really like to start growing flowers for lane making, or um, I'm really interested in agroforestry and I'd love to be able to help with maybe some of the tree selection or the understory. Um, how would you, are you interested in those sorts of collaborators? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and um, we've been working together for a long time, yeah, the, the general idea. And, and so you, you have a really good grasp of, of this. We just met uh, Emily Emmons just a few weeks ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. and she's, uh, uh, she has a program already operating. So mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to figure out how, you know, as a matter of fact, from a broad point of view, what we'd like to do is work with lots of nonprofits because mm -hmm. nonprofits are all trying to do the best they can for the people in general. Mm -hmm. In, in what we, we're doing, as long as it's in parallel with what they think is good, we can yeah. all collaborate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm 100% I'm open-minded about what, what is possible. That's why I, I don't want to be real specific. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. So we can. For sure. Choose. Yeah. Okay. So if there's nonprofits or there's uh, local organizations, uh, maybe if there's school groups, or um, maybe if they're budding or interested uh, beginning farmers, um, how would you suggest that they reach out if they were interested in potentially collaborating with you? How would you like to be contacted? Yeah, well, you know, the best bet is we have this group, Kyoke and Malia, mm -hmm. and that's what our objective is to try to make life better for future generations, yeah? So we, we're mm -hmm. going to... Um, uh, enable that organization to collect information and collaborate back and forth with people. Okay. I think that, that sounds wonderful. Uh, any other uh, finishing thoughts? Uh, anything you want us to know about what the modern day Aqua might look like in the future, who you want to work with, anything you've already done, anything at all, Richard, before we close up? Yeah. Well, so it's... Uh, what will life look like a hundred years from now? You know, if, if we're looking out that far, then, and we're sitting out here in the largest ocean in the whole world, we better be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. So that's about enough motivation to, to, to do, do the right stuff, I think. For sure. And I'm excited to see that manifested in the modern day. Wow. Yeah, awesome. I got, I got to say, though, I really appreciate working with you, you know, because oh, we, thanks, Richard. We, we've been we've been talking about this and it didn't take me very long to figure out who you were, because I don't know the <laughs> science, you know, I mean, you, you're up way the hell up there. But for me, I knew who you were inside, you know, and so I, I want to say that. Yeah, that, that's important. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Well, I love working with you, too. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have lots more to report on the modern day Hawaii uh, here for you guys soon. Yeah. Uh, but this is Inventing Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, thank you to our viewers for watching. If you want to get our email advisories to see a complete listing of our shows, you can sign up for those on thinktechhawaii.com. We'll be back in two weeks. So please tune in to do a deeper dive into our N invention. Until then, I'm Brittany Zimmerman. And I'm Richard Hoff. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. 
We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.